Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm calling this meeting to order. Uh, I am Douglas Kellner, co-chair. Uh, sitting next to me is uh, Peter Krasinski, co-chair. Um, to my left uh, is uh, Commissioner Gregory Peterson, and to my right, uh, Commissioner Andrew Spano. Uh, the first item of business is uh, approval of the minutes and the executive minutes from July 25th and the minutes from August 28th. Uh, does anyone have any corrections? Second. Uh, those in favor of approving those minutes say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so the minutes are approved. Uh, we'll move to our unit reports and we'll start with our co-executive directors Robert Brem and Todd Valentine. Um, the work is very um, much been around getting ready. Primary is starting to heat up as far as calls and activities, um, uh, which is typical as we go into an election. Um, with regard to our group of legislation that we have been monitoring uh, since our last meeting, uh, we have seen the change of enrollment bill uh, approved uh, and information shared with the county boards on what that uh, does to the pending changes. Uh, in addition to what is the new period of time that they that, that a change of enrollment would not become effective immediately. Um, uh, one other law that uh, was signed by the governor related to uh, the time or the, the time and the manner in which our, um, election workers uh, can receive their um, special ballot before an election. It used to be within the two weeks of an election. It's now during any time that an absentee ballot can be available to them. Um, uh, so that we had earlier had a chapter law uh, re with regard to victims of domestic violence, um, both a victim of domestic violence and a special worker for elections are on the same application. The instructions for when they're available are on the application. We, we waited for the amendment to the application and the amendment to the special ballot envelope as long as we could, um, hoping that we would only have to amend them once. Um, the governor's office did ask us what that deadline would be and the co-executive directors reached out to the print vendors in the counties and we determined that was uh, mid-September. The governor signed the bill by mid-September so we uh, provided that instruction to all the voters too. So there's there are now 26 chapters. There are 24 that are still pending that we are waiting on. Um, I haven't heard anything new with regard to that list lately, um, and I have not seen any of them moving to go from the legislature to the governor. Um, and I do check that mailbox a couple of times a day just to see. So I think that's where we're at with regard to the new legislation. Certainly, um, we'll have to figure out the lay of the land to come up with what our recommendations will be for next year. Um, you know, what needs a cleanup maybe that might not have happened with all of these bills uh, and what's left that they didn't do that was on our list that maybe we could try and encourage them to do if they're still on our list next year. So, so we're starting to move in that direction. What do we want to get ready for next year? Um, paying the bills. Budget is another major time consumer of the co-executive directors and others in the agency. Um, we continue to meet regularly with the deputy secretary um, and our staff to review spending. Uh, we. Are, are working with the Deputy Secretary, our hosted partners at OGS with a meeting scheduled for tomorrow to um, go over our notes as how do we project spending through the end of this fiscal year 
um, and also what do we expect to project into the next fiscal year. We have not yet received the budget call letter. It usually comes out soon, uh, and we anticipate that the budget will be due somewhere by mid-October. Um, so projecting how to what what um, we have available to spend this year, what our projections will be, um, and what our projected shortfall might be. Uh, is still, from our planning purposes, within the uh, numbers that we gave you in the, in the summer when we asked you to um, encumber the funds from the state cyber account. We asked you to $1.2 million based on our estimate today. We, are, we estimate that we will need to use about 800000 of that based on where we see the trend. Um, So we hope to have a, a more finite number for you at the December meeting in case we need to ask you to go above that number if for some reason the trend goes far, farther along than we anticipate. Um, but I think we're on track for the recommendation we gave you based on what we know now. <coughs> uh, the other ask would be um, what do we envision that we would need for cybersecurity going into the next year. Um, our original plan that we were asked to produce in relation to cybersecurity for the election infrastructure had recommended a state commitment of $5 million each year for three years. We received the first year funds, but not the second year funds. Um, we did receive $19.5 million in federal funds, which from our calculation, all of about a half a million dollars of that has been encumbered for particular projects to either make um, a greater security uh, risk management um, at the county boards or at the state board um, uh, for projects. Um, so, we're, you know, part of that major effort was the report from Grant Thornton to do the risk assessments of the county. I think it last I saw we're at 39 or 40 county reports, uh, 16 that are finalized recently that we're working to get those reports to the county. But we also have a draft trend report that we just received earlier in the week. We're looking to review that to be able to share that um, information as a basis for asking for next year's budget. Um, so we're analyzing what they see as a pattern, and and more importantly, with our secure election staff and others, based on the patterns that are being identified, what would be the best approach um, as far as um, resources, people, time, money, in order to uh, close the gaps that we identify, and and how best to accomplish that. We hope to have that finished in time to submit the budget request. Um, by October is our goal. Um, it's probably something that will continue as we see other reports um, if we have to make adjustments to it anyway. Um, but, but that's our goal with regard to the budget. Um, staffing, I think uh, uh, we've had a number of changes because of a retirement or, or reshuffling people to deal with the retirement, but, but one other, uh, uh, Donna, my secretary um, and yours um, announced she's retiring so this would have been her last day but she's home taking care of her grandson who's sick today um, and her last meeting her, her last meeting her last day will so be mid uh, November so we certainly will miss her she's worked here for 20 years and at least three directors on our side um, um, so we wish her well. We know from all of our retirees who come back to visit with us, they smile a lot and they're very happy. <laughs> but we wish her well. So that's another change that we will be seeing shortly. Uh, other than that, um, it's, we are getting a lot of calls as we begin the presidential cycle um, as far as getting information out on that process. We have the political calendar out for the presidential cycle. Um, we are starting to get phone calls from people trying to figure out 
as typical, um, you know, who's running for president, but more importantly, how does it work, whether it's coming from the county boards of election. There were a lot of changes in four years at the county boards of election, so there are a lot of local administrators who haven't lived through a presidential cycle, worked through it. They've lived through it. They haven't worked through it. Um, so certainly we're, we're doing our best to try and answer those questions, but they're just starting to ramp up. Uh, again, you know, we wish Donna the best in her retirement. You know, she was here. Um, I, it's hard for me to remember a time when she wasn't here, although I was here before. It's just hard for me to remember that, so she'll definitely be missed in the transition we'll work on. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add on the budget was, you may have seen in the media that the federal government is considering putting in an additional cybersecurity fund. Uh, one house had six hundred. Fifty million dollars, and the other had two hundred fifty million. So they have to go to a conference committee to try to settle it out. We expect it'll be somewhere in that range. So that would be, if they follow the past practice as they did with the prior cyber money we got, of the nineteen point five million, that that would probably be in the neighborhood of ten to twelve million dollars. Um, right now, we have very little authority to spend that. So even if they gave it to us at the beginning of their fiscal year, we only have. Uh, an appropriation available to spend that, so uh, only for like a couple million because we didn't know how much we were going to get the last time, so that would have to incorporate into our plans for what we would do with that. So, um, but early voting is what we've been working on for most of the counties, and certainly looking at the presidential year, we started that with the counties, the education at the conference, we'll continue that at the meeting in January, um, and as Things start to happen towards the beginning of January. The petitions start to you know, we'll continue to ramp that up. All right, thank you. <coughs> Any questions? All right, then we'll go to the councils uh, Kim Galvin and Brian Quayle. Good <coughs> afternoon, commissioners. Um, just uh, to begin with a little uh, calendar item, uh, Friday is the uh, deadline for the 32-day free general report. So we just want to underscore that for our, uh, our filing community. Um, I'm pleased to report that here we are on um, this uh, day in very early October, and um, from the perspective of the State Board of Elections, all ballot access litigation actually has been concluded. We don't have any. Um, hanging issues out there that um, that would uh, uh, cause ballot changes. So that that is always a good thing and a point of some relief. And the um, first time in 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. It's like there's always at least one thing that is still pending. And so we feel really good about that. Um, with respect to um, our cases, we had a couple um, decisions come down, both favorable. Um, in the DeRosier case, uh, Judge Sharp accepted the magistrate's report uh, with respect to um, political apparel <clears throat> and uh, New York's electioneering laws uh, not being a violation of the federal constitution. That was, um, that was welcome news. Um, in the upstate, as we colloquially call it, the upstate jobs two case, um, the fourth department ultimately uh, came to the same conclusion that the third department came to in um, KLV Kellner with respect to the constitutionality of uh, 7104 and the placement of independent bodies um, on the ballot in terms of consolidating their uh, line with another placement for a candidate who already appears. Um, so that also welcome news. Um, the, the unit has been exceptionally busy um, with uh, the council's unit with uh, fielding uh, telephone calls as we move into the fall. Um, we are uh, we provide a significant amount of support to county boards of elections and with all the statutory changes and early voting um, that call volume has uh, ramped up substantially. I think we're meeting it pretty well. Um, and if there are any detractors out there who are, who are watching and haven't gotten back to you uh, on a call, let us know because we think we're caught up. Um, as far as um, uh, the other work of the, uh, uh, the unit, we've been very busy with ongoing uh, litigation. And as, as always, uh, we like to talk about the the cumulative effort of the compliance staff in terms of what they're doing. Um, we're up to 132,482 uh, filings received. Um, the review on uh, 118,329 of those um, has been completed. So that 
that differential is, is quite acceptable. Uh, we're keeping up with the, uh, the incoming workflow and managing very well. With respect to um, filings of um, uh, 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 filings uh, for the July periodic, um, we have, uh, as of today, we have outstanding uh, non-filers of 2,674. Uh, with respect to the January periodic, the outstanding number is 2,134. Um, paid internet digital ads, I don't believe we've gotten any new ones of late, so the number of filings in that category stands still at 113 of the 93 independent expenditure committees that are out there. 18 have filed at least one um, paid internet digital ad. Anything else, Kim? No, just the vacancy in the Congressional District out west has sparked a lot of attention, too, and specials mm -hmm. and the timing, if there is one. And, um, we're also getting a lot of calls. It's kind of a controversial topic, but the LLC law that was passed, if you recall, the, the, the stakeholders or the owners had to be reported to us by December 1st but the committees are taking filings all along and there's been a, a large volume of calls where they reach out to the LLC, they won't tell them who the stakeholders are, they don't have to file the report with us until December 1st. There's a whole contingent of problems swirling around with that particular timing of filing and taking contributions that we're working through the best we can. So, so what happens if an LLC will not inform the committee to which they've made the contribution well the principles are that's interesting um, the law doesn't tell you what to do with the money um, some have sent us some have returned it some have sent us letters um, saying showing us the letters that they've sent the LLC for the breakout of the ownership but I guess when we get to December 1st, we look at who's filed. Some are starting to file now, and then cross-check them and make them available to the candidates to see if their LLC is one that filed, and then deal with the residual people that their LLC didn't file and they were given an otherwise legal contribution. So. And what does that mean, deal with the residual people? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know. We haven't worked through it. Uh, specifically yet maybe they'll have to return the money uh, it seems to be more of an enforcement unit if they don't file their filings as required by the law by December 1st but uh, there's a lot of calls on that it seems like it should have been reversed like the filings be made January 1st and then you can give the contributions instead of give the contributions all year and then file on December 1st, but it's a little juxtaposed, so we're trying to work through that. But that is a, a, a big concern to a whole group of filers, from the very small to the very large. So, so when a filer files and they got money from an LLC, how do, how, what are they reporting now? Do they say LLC so-and-so gave me $500? Yeah, and then they have to break out on, oh, who the owners are. So right now they're just saying LLC. Well, some they, some they, some some they no. get, yeah. I mean, you're running into a lot of problems, too, with at a very local level, like the owner of a pizza, pizza parlor, for example, is incorporated as LLC, and they let you hold an event there, but that's really, a, you know, an in-kind contribution for the place, and the pizza owner doesn't know they're supposed to file this report with us, so... We've done a lot of outreach, we've posted directions on the web, but it's those types of questions that are taking a lot of time for the staff, so we're trying to work through and come up with suggestions maybe for a, a, a statute modification or a regulation modification or something like that. So the LOCs are notified by the recipient. Typically, that's who tells them they have this requirement. How do they know they well, have this requirement? Well, we notified them. We sent order. them all a letter that they filed that this was a new change in the we, law. We the compliance that. unit to we the LLCs. Which LLCs? All LLCs? I think the one we didn't. 
to all the ones, LLCs. No, the we, ones we that were filed. We posted it online and we sent it to filers. Right. Okay. Um, but th this is very similar to the way partnerships um, yeah. work. The partnership makes a contribution and they're supposed to provide the information um, that would be necessary for the sub breakout right. of, the, of the contribution. LLCs now fall into that, um, into that place. And the treasurers of the committees that receive LLC contributions in the first instance are responsible for gathering that information from the LLCs. And then what happens, as Kim elucidated, is what if the LLC doesn't provide the information? Um, and in some instances, people have informed us that they would like to wait until um, the filing in December by the LLC, and at which point they're going to have what they need to amend right. their filing. So they're kind of putting a placeholder out there and saying, well, we can't get it, we don't have it, we're going to get it in December. Um, but fundamentally, it seems to me that the obligation is on the treasurer, like it is when the treasurer receives a contribution so, from... So how does the LLC know they have to do this December filing? Um, the, what we posted on our website and then the statute. So it's just assuming the LLCs will look at And the candidates the, reaching out to and, them. And yes. So, we're, so we're, we're relying on the candidates to reach out to these LLCs to let them know you have this filing obligation with the State Board of Elections by December 1. In, in the first instance, to gather the information that the Treasurer needs to make their disclosure, there is that. But we have not done an outreach to all LLCs in the state. And I don't well, know what that would entail. Because yeah. there are so many. It's most numerous entity that there is that's out there. Um, but we do check to make sure, I mean, obviously there's a $5,000 threshold, so these aren't the huge donations that you used to see the LLCs uh, giving. Um, they they fall under the threshold. One, and some of the interesting, Brian's going to kill me, some of the interesting things that we're saying is the LLC law is written in such a way that people say, you know, they haven't fixed it, but really they have because when you break out personally, it goes to the individual limit. So the entity itself, unlike a corporation, can't give $5,000. It's, it's broken out and attributed to that individual as you break it down. So a lot of questions are, okay, if that's to identify the people, you have a, if it's under a certain amount, do they, have to break, do they still have to break it out? If it goes into housekeeping, do they still have to break it out? Or, you know, there's a lot of questions from a lot of people on this law. Yeah, one of the issues we have pending is um, related to this is the issue of how the $99 itemization right. rule applies to the threshold. So, for instance, uh, there's one school of thought that says that the $99 itemization is the general rule and that when you break out, as we historically did with partnerships on Schedule O where the LLCs would be, that same $99 rule would apply. So you would only put itemization, if you will, of the substrata of the LLC to the extent that any portion of it, you know, in essence, exceeded the $99. So that's one of the types of things we're wrestling with. There's a lot of questions about them. Anything else? All right, well, thank you. Uh, we'll now move to election operations. Tom Connolly and Brendan Lugul. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, with regard to elections, since the last meeting, we did prepare the general election certification, and we distributed that and sample ballot layouts to all the counties. Uh, as Kim mentioned, there's now a vacancy in the 27th Congressional District, and so we had prepared the documentation that went out to, I believe, the eight counties in that district, letting them know that their, the vacancy uh, was created. Um, we did receive judicial assignments from the OCA for early voting and election day, but just for New York City. Uh, we've been working with OCA because they kind of break it up into the New York City and outside of New York City. So we've been working with OCA on um, getting the judicial assignments for early voting and election day for all the other counties. I provided them with the list of all the, the, the times that each county is going to be open and closing for early voting in each county because they usually break it down first by judicial district and then by individual county. So they know uh, and can be sure that they have 100% um, coverage for each county. Uh, with regard to voting machines, uh, we, from the ESNS front, we review the draft secondary source code review uh, with NYSTEC. Uh, we are awaiting, we should be receiving the final version this week and then would be working with the, uh, the company as far as whatever those findings in that um, review report was. Uh, we would anticipate probably some potential software changes, and we are aware of at least one other one. Uh, Brendan and I did discuss where we were shown a function uh, functionality at the at the summer conference 
that uh, comes from software that we have not yet received. And our understanding from the company is that they were waiting to see what was going to come out of the secondary source code review and then submit any software changes that were necessary from that in addition to uh, this new software functionality, which I can provide copies of it. But basically, in the past, on the ballot cards, what they're printing is um, they print out barcodes, and sometimes there would be, there's three to a row, and so depending on how many races were being voted in, they were blank spots, and there was a concern that theoretically there could be overprinting later on and fill in those blank spots. Uh, the software that they're going to be submitting, whenever there is a blank spot, they put it in a square with an X through it so that no barcode could be printed on top of it, or even if one was, it wouldn't be readable. Um, so they, we, we were told that we will be receiving that software after they <coughs> get the results from the secondary source code review. Uh, with regard to Dominion, we did complete the functional well, test. And so what is the status of the secondary source code review? So we had Which is with NYSTEC? NYSTEC had um, kind of found a, uh, a vendor to do the secondary source code review. That, that company is called ATSEC. Uh, we had reviewed with NYSTEC uh, late last week the, the draft findings, and we were told that we should expect to receive the final report, I believe, today, uh, in which case we would then share that, those findings with ESNS uh, and also their testing lab in, in case there was any additional information that we wanted to see uh, as a result of that. Uh, with regard to the Dominion ICE, uh, there is, we did complete the functional testing for Dominion counter upgrade. There was a public test that was held on 924 for that, and there are documents that were prepared and provided to the commissioners. There is an agenda item later on. Uh, clear about the last meeting, the commissioners certified version 1.6 that was distributed to the counties who use that system. Um, we did also receive notice that they were going to be submitting an engineering change order just for some end-of-life hardware. Largely, it was just a matter of the, some of the, the computers that were being used, uh, the versions of the server, the model of the, uh, the servers uh, just becoming newer because some of the older servers were just end-of-life. Uh, there are also two new companies that are interested in possibly submitting um, systems or at least components of systems for review. Uh, Heart InterCivic will be coming to the board. We have spoken to them in the past. They did bring some equipment and show it to us previously. They're going to be coming to the board on uh, 1016 to talk with the uh, ops team about uh, the certification process and possibly submitting one of the, or more of their systems for consideration. In addition, Democracy Live also has a, um, an ADA ballot marking device uh, that kind of is very compact and fairly inexpensive uh, that we've looked at a couple times. We did also speak with them. They've been in touch uh, with our team about possibly moving forward with submitting that device for consideration. Uh, lastly, on the voting machines front, the current voting machine contract, the state contract, ends in uh, January of 2021. So we've been working with the Office of General Services uh, you know, on, on trying to get the new contract moving only because it usually takes that long to kind of get all of the, the different moving parts in play. Uh, Brennan and I and have discussed with others internally and also discussed with OGS the possibility of engaging some of the stakeholders just to see if there is any feedback they would want to provide that might um, inform us in, in moving forward if we wanted to change any of the provisions or language or add certain protections in from either a security standpoint or just to get the feedback from, let's say, the counties on their, their experience with the current contract just to see if anything should be uh, should be done differently in the next, next contract. Um, with regard to electronic poll books, uh, we've been continuing to work with counties. A lot of them have been working on uh, procuring the electronic poll book systems. We've been wa working with the Office of General Services on any kind of documentation that they need for either from us as we approve uh, the systems or revisions to the systems. Um, also, with regard to some additional peripherals like ballot on demand printers and charging racks and things like that. We've been trying to kind of facilitate the conversations that need to happen between the vendors and OGS so that those items can get put on state contract so that the counties can buy them uh, with enough time to kind of put them out in the field and get their poll workers trained. Um, can I just follow sure. up on that issue? So right now, are counties able to buy ballot on demand printers through a state contract? Yes, two of the three e-poll book vendors have on their um, price list uh, ballot on demand printers. 
And, and are all three e poll book vendors available through state contracts if yes. the counties wanted to, to go in that route? Yes. So if a county board, is it appropriate? Uh, all right, I want to phrase the question properly. Um, uh, would it be valid to say that a county board um, uh, uh, I'm sorry uh, is it accurate if a county board says we are not using e poll books because there is no contract available for us to purchase it I don't see how that would be a valid statement okay all right all right. Uh, um, thank you. You've answered my question. Sure. You can go on with your report. Uh, in addition, as part of the law that allowed for the use of electronic poll books, the state board was tasked with a number of different um, responsibilities, obviously one of which was uh, evaluating and approving uh, systems for use. One of the other things that we were tasked with doing is certifying the networks that are used by the e-poll books uh, to ensure that they follow our, our security requirements. Um, to that end, we did provide the counties with uh, a checklist <laughs> of 11 um, different security protections that they should be putting in place were applicable for any of the, the networks that are going to be used by the e public systems, either during election day or the early voting period. Uh, that survey was due back to us yesterday. Uh, we have more than half of the counties have responded, so we'll, our staff will be following up with them today in the coming days to make sure that we get uh, surveys from everyone who's going to be using e poll books. Obviously, there are counties that will not be using electronic poll book systems this year, um, but we had asked them previously on a um, the statewide uh, ECA call, uh, as well as some numerous email reminders that even if they weren't going to be using e poll book systems, to at least let us know that so we can mark them down and uh, not continually nag them for something that they're not going to give us. Uh, Brendan and I also did go out. Uh, I guess a month or two ago to Madison and Onondaga counties. They were using um, the knowing system for some uh, small elections. I think Onondaga was a, a town election and Madison was like a water district water election. District, so uh, Onondaga, we actually got there a little early because we didn't realize that they weren't starting the election until noon. So but they did have all the machines set up. So we were able to kind of go over it with them and talk to the commissioners about uh, their experience with the system. Uh, Madison, we were able to see the kind of the back end system that the boards can see. It's kind of, they had a large TV set up with sort of like a little portal with dashboard and different metrics. Uh, they were able to receive communication directly from the poll site from the poll workers while we were there. Uh, and then we also went out and visited the poll site and spoke with the poll workers about their experience with the system and how voters were interacting with it. So that seemed all very favorable. So it was nice to see that actually out in the field in practice. Um, in addition, we presented at the summer conference for the Election Commissioners Association. Uh, we've been continuing our work, working with counties and vendors on updating procedures uh, for early voting. We did perform acceptance testing for counties that received new Dominion ICE machines in Sullivan, Tompkins, Rensselaer, Westchester, and Orange. Uh, new York City and Erie counties received some new uh, DS200s from ESNS, so we did acceptance testing there, and we also did county asset visits at Schuyler, Tompkins, Tioga, Niagara, Erie, Genesee, Livingston, and Yates. Brendan? I'm good. Um, so uh, uh, you provided the commissioners uh, this morning with this uh, very uh, interesting chart on um, where the counties stand in uh, uh, complying with the uh, reporting requirements uh, with respect to implementation of early voting. And I see that uh, virtually all of the counties, uh, with the exception of uh, New York City, have uh, provided uh, their accessibility survey surveys. You have um, communications plans um, submitted by uh, almost all of the counties. Um, I, I see Suffolk and Nassau are, and Cattaraugus are and Albany are the uh, uh, only jurisdictions that are missing. And uh, 
at least with respect to Nassau and Suffolk, I've seen a lot of things in the press uh, with respect to them. So, uh, but but uh, uh, on the other hand, with the security plans, um, virtually none of the large counties have uh, submitted their security plans. Um, I think Ulster is the largest county that's actually submitted a security plan. So what, what's the story with that, and um, what are you doing to follow up with those jurisdictions that haven't submitted their security plans? So I don't know if the, the Codex want to handle this one solely because a lot of the different columns in, in this are being handled by different units because some of the, the documents that are required by the county boards have to be uh, reviewed by the co-execs. I know PIO has been receiving some of the documents, like the communication plans. The election ops, we've been dealing largely with the, the network surveys for EPOL books. And then we also have the last two columns as far as ensuring uh, no double voting and the second to last one, which is now escaping me, but... That's the last one. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, the, the, pr the premature... Uh, Publication well, of election so, results. So for your network security plan, I see that New York City has given you a, net, a network security plan. For the e-poll books, right. They, they did submit something to us. We are we had a question about it this morning that we saw, because I think we got it last night. Yes, sir. Um, so we're just waiting on a clarifying response from them, but we have received documentation from them for their network security for their e-poll books. But then the next largest, and, and you have Westchester has given you a plan. But Nassau and Suffolk have not, um, and Erie has not. Um, so those are pretty large counties without network plans. What's going on with them? Right, so the, so the deadline for the network plans was yesterday, so that's why today we were going to be starting to harass anyone who hadn't yet submitted one to us. And what does that mean? I mean, what... Well, I mean, basically, we're going to reach out to them and try to understand a couple things. Number one, are you using ePoll books? If so, can you fill out this survey for us? Because we try to make it as easy as possible. It's really not a survey per poll site. It's a survey per configuration. So in the case of New York City, if they're going to be using the exact same hardware and software and network setup for all of the different poll sites, they have to submit one survey. That tells us how it's being configured, and then they would have to attach a list of the poll sites for which that configuration applies. Um, so we would and, just. And what's the point of that submission to the state? What is our role in reviewing that? Right. So as part, of, like I said earlier, the the language in the law that allowed for the usage of of e poll books uh, tasked the state board with doing a couple of things. And one of them was the languages I believe certify the networks to which the e poll book systems are connected. So we obviously certified the hardware and we certified the software when we approved the systems but they can be kind of implemented in different ways. They could be implemented either using cellular iPads, uh, where they're connecting directly to the, the network. They could be implemented using MiFi or, or cellular hotspots. They could be implemented using Wi-Fi routers, um, or they could even be hardwired into a system somewhere. So we came up with 11 different security requirements around the, the network aspect of the larger e poll book system. Um, and for whatever configuration they, they end up using, um, we just wanted to be sure that they tried to put as many of these protections in place where possible. Some of them aren't always possible because whereas if you have either a wireless hotspot or a cellular hotspot, you have the ability to kind of log onto a control panel and set certain configurations. If you're using a cellular iPad, it's going directly straight to the, the network, and so you don't obviously have the ability to, let's say, enable logging or to not broadcast the, the, the network name because there is no network name in that situation. So a lot of these were just to the extent possible, depending on how you were going to configure the, the network aspect of the e book system, we wanted them to try to put in as many of these protections and to at least tell us that they did so. So early voting starts in three weeks? And just over and, and our role at this point is really just as an extra set of eyes to make sure that this, well, yes, I mean, it's not enough. okay for them to come back and say, no, we didn't implement any of these things unless there's a really good reason why. And the only real good reason why would be it's not possible with the configuration that we're using. All right. Now, on the other hand, with the security plans, virtually none of the large counties, as I say, Ulster is the largest county that submitted a security plan. 
so what's happening with that, and what are the consequences of not having a, a security plan submitted to the State Board? We, we uh, the Office of the State Board, covered uh, that topic on a call with all of the counties on, th on Thursday last week was our monthly call, reminding them that these were due. Um, and we followed up after the call with a list, because as you can see, there's several in addition to the security plan. You know, where in the regulation does it require them to either give us a procedure or a plan? And, and, and there are different units in the agency taking the lead on receiving them. So we provided a reminder by email following up on the phone call. Uh, what are the specific requirements in the regulation? Here's the regulation. Here's the requirement. Here's the unit to send that answer to. Um, just to make sure that we onboard what people are giving us. There are some when, when they have given us, um, so, uh, some counties might have given us a communication plan, labeled it a communication plan, might have one of these other factors in there. So the staff has been looking to make sure of whatever we got from counties labeled as something, it doesn't also include something else that they didn't label uh, that information. There weren't many of those, but there were one or two. I'm not sure you're really answering my question. But we did ask. So the, the, the legislature wanted security plans, understanding that there was a new layer of complexity with early voting, especially because you have to close down each day and, and you have questions about what's going to happen to the ballots and to the records uh, with, the, with the overnight process. Um, so so um, what, what is going to happen if counties do not provide a security plan? And, and it's a requirement that, that, that we actually approve that plan. And they put a time limit on the executive directors to uh, approve or reject the plan within 14 days of submission. And of course, every county that hasn't submitted a plan is out of compliance with that statutory mandate. So what, what are the consequences if a county simply ignores us and does not submit a security plan? We have not discouraged anyone from not giving us a plan. We have encouraged them to give us a plan. We will have staff calling those. I mean, we did a phone call reminder and an email reminder to get the plans, and the next would be a phone call reminder to the individual counties. When will we get your plan? But this we is a statutory mandate. It's not something voluntary on the part of the county. They are required to do this and they have not complied with this statutory mandate. And virtually all of the significant jurisdictions in the state are out of compliance with respect to this. So it seems to me that we need a more detailed policy on what we are going to do to, to obtain compliance with this mandate. Well, are, yes. Are you suggesting that the state board is not going to do anything oh. if the county does not give us a plan well, in time to be approved for the opening of early voting in three weeks? The, the wording of the regulation, I know we've had some questions about it, and the questions we've had from the counties has, uh, in the regulation identifies that... Um, the ballots, the portable memory devices, um, and the poll books be secured and brought back to the Board of Elections each night, or that they have a security plan that is approved by us uh, if they're going to do something other than that. Um, so, considering there are about 34 locations that are at county boards of elections, many of the ones that we've seen are at the Board of Elections and their plan has you're, been You're deflecting that. from my question. I'm talking about the large counties, not the small counties. 
I don't think they. I don't. I don't think anyone knows what they're going to do. We well, haven't discussed it. I think it. we need to. I'll answer his question. Well, I mean, let me, was there a mechanism put into the statute? For us to enforce this, was there some? There's no separate mechanism for enforcement with regards. To <clears throat> I mean, sometimes the problem with these mandates, and we've had this before, is they mandate the counties to do something. It's our obligation to enforce it, but we're given no enforcement mechanism. We don't have a hammer, so to speak. We we don't, for example, provide funding to our county boards of elections that we could say, if you don't do this for us, we're going to withhold your funding which is a common mechanism that governments use to enforce things. This sounds Another like government. Risa Sugarman's explanation on why she doesn't prosecute non-filers. We could go to court and compel each of these county boards to I guess that I guess that's plan. it. I mean, as far as I know, that's probably the only enforcement mechanism that might exist is us going to court and having a court order and then if you don't do it, I guess you're in violation you're in of the court, you're in contempt, yeah. and that's the penalty. But we, as an entity, do not have that administrative mechanism that I'm aware of to enforce this mandate. Now, tell me if I'm wrong. No, I, I would agree with you. But I, but I mean, I, you know, we've been in this tough position before, I know, as an agency where, you know, we're supposed to make a county do something, but we really aren't given the yeah, mechanism. My concern is that I have a sense that um, that there is, we have not shown sufficient commitment on the part of the state board to fulfill this part of the statutory mandate. Uh, that we're sort of complicit at this point with the county boards that are ignoring it. Um, I don't know that I would agree with that. I mean, well, I guess I'm in favor of commencing a proceeding. Uh, in Albany County Supreme Court against each of the counties that hasn't got a security plan unless they get it to us, say, by next Tuesday, or, um, which is two weeks before the commencement of early voting. Um, I mean, I think it's serious that they're, that they're not submitting these plans in a way that we can review them. And, and I guess... It, even more so that the public can review them. Um, I, I, agree, I agree with you. I agree with him. Without and I think that the more we we given a responsibility to make, try to make this happen, and it doesn't happen, and nothing happens. I think that's a that's a disaster going forward with any of these things, whether it's been in the past or that, that's why people don't answer it. And I, I think a, a, a warning and then an action is appropriate. Well, that, that could be part of the problem. I don't know the tenor of the correspondence that uh, has transpired regarding this. Um, my experience in life and as an attorney and everything else is that if I get a letter which is this, by the way, you have to do this, I say, okay, fine, I put that under here, and I move on to something else. Um, however, if I get a letter that says, here is the, here is the statute, boom, right in bold print, highlighted, or however you want to do it, you know, you are now out of compliance with every requirement, and, and if this is not corrected immediately, blah, 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 we will, we will pursue this in court. Yeah. Something along those, a real strong letter, holy crap, you know, all of a sudden that gets to the top of the pile and something happens. And you can certainly do that by, by, uh, by faxing it directly to, the, to the, the, the boards who are delinquent. You send it out today, tomorrow, boom, they get it. Let's see what kind of, what, what kind of feedback we get. And of course, as, as uh, Commissioner Keller has said, there's also bingo. You, you know, if you don't, we're going to embarrass you by, by suing you in court. To force this. I, I, I would like that. to do that, and I think that we need to have a kind of follow up, perhaps a standby meeting for the commissioners to meet by telephone to discuss what to do, you know, in the middle of next week if this isn't. Uh, well, we should get our toughest letter writer here to write something that's really tough. Well, you did a good send, job send it out. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when they get something like that, all of a sudden it catches everybody's attention. 
It can't well, be la di da. And I think that that we, as a as a board of commissioners, should be prepared to take action if, in fact, it appears that the counties are not meeting their statutory responsibility here. So, so just for a minute, Bob, could you go over that statutory requirement again? You just read that about when the counties have to file a report with us. It's There's a the situation where they don't. Is that correct? That if they do it a certain way? 6211.2A, all ballots cast during the early voting period by any method allowed under law shall be canvassed and counted as if cast on election day. At the end of each day of early voting, all voted and unvoted ballots shall be reconciled and along with any portable memory devices containing voting information and registration poll records returned to the Board of Elections or otherwise secured pursuant to a plan approved by the State Board of Elections, excuse me, State Board, at least 60 days before the first election at which such plans okay, so should are, be so are you reading that that if they if they return all of the ballots to the to the board of elections each night and the, and the sticks each night they don't have to submit a plan it's only if they're going to do something other than that that they have to submit a plan is that the way we're reading that regulation i, I i'm sort of looking I at the attorneys I, for this more I, than you bob I, actually I, what I do will, you guys think that that, that is I, I admit that the language is subject to some ambiguity and but that is the way that I believe we have articulated it to okay. counties. So it could be that the counties are anticipating to do that, and that's why they're not submitting plans? I believe or that do we know? I believe that some are possible. doing that and submitted plans, okay. you know, the, the ones we have received. Okay. That is what they're doing, but they still gave us a plan. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if there are others that are doing that, thought they didn't need to give us a plan also because of the way this is worded. Um, I don't know that anybody has said, I haven't heard from a county that said, do I need to give you a plan? Um, but when we've discussed this, um, when we were in Saratoga at the conference, it came up, we basically read this. If you, you know, the need is certainly security with regard to ballots, accountability in a bipartisan way, the opening and closing that you can sure. now cover nine days of opening and closing and then election day. Um, but, but that language. So it's possible we didn't get a plan for people because they read that too. I'm bringing it back to the board. I don't have to give you a plan. Yeah. Um, but then we should hear that at least. We yeah, should we at least should know. That. that should be the plan. Yes. Well, so or, or at least that should be the response. Back. I mean, listen, I agree. Bell security is a high priority here. So we need to be sure that the counties are providing adequate ballot security. And if, if we don't have assurances of that, I agree. We need to take some action to make sure that's happening out there. Well, then, in any letter you send out, you say, you say if you are doing X, Y, and Z, we, we want to know that. We could say it that way, sure. After you By say what you said. And catch their attention. Okay. That's right. I agree. I agree. Okay. Well, but I, I know think the there's a consensus and, and, you know, that I, we... I, I know I, the staff is talking to these counties all the time, and I hope they would share with them our concerns, if they're not watching today, that... You know, the commissioners are very concerned about this, and we would like to see it happen. And if not, we're prepared to take further action. Yeah, I think uh, my goal here was to ramp this up as to not just a right. discussion with mm -hmm. the counties, but something to make it clear that this is not voluntary. They're not doing us a favor by sending us the plan, that this is mandatory, mm -hmm. um, and that we are, in fact, supervising this. And I say this with the recognition that, that our staff has worked um, very, very hard um, sure. with respect to early voting and has, um, um, it's, it's been a, um, a, a very difficult and time-consuming process to, uh, to get this done on such short notice. And I'm sure that's the case at the county boards too. But, um, I mean, we do hear that, uh, especially, all, uh, we hear that from our staff, but at the county level, I, I can, I can say with clarity that if there's any doubt, because they are onboarding new equipment, you know, policies are are are, are being fine-tuned as they now are actually getting the equipment and training inspectors and learning things they didn't know. But, but, right. but they right. should send us what they have. Right. And, and, and if it's still not finished, um, I really... 
first of all, early voting starts in three weeks. So um, uh, they, they should send us what they have um, so that um, we can comment on it and the public can comment on it. I mean, just on the county's behalf, from my conversations and discussions with them, I'm not aware of any county that is unaware that, that they're securing their ballots. They have long before this, so this is not a new requirement to them that they secure their ballots. The time frame for the remote sites is, is the, the twist on this. But all of them, to a T, in my conversations, are fully aware of their need to that. Now, whether the plan has been filed or not, I quite understand that they and, need to do what we've asked and them. And whether it's satisfactory is a big issue, though, because I've, I mean, I've heard uh, um, suggestions of what some counties are planning to do that, in my view, are completely inadequate. So, for example, I've heard of a proposal that they would um, hire an off-duty police officer to overnight with the ballots. I don't think that's sufficient um, because um, uh, that, that's, that's basically trusting one person uh, with custody of all of these materials and that that alone is not a sufficient uh, security plan. And I think we need to have these articulated so that people can comment on the adequacy of the security plan. Are, are you saying a police officer would not be sufficient security? In my view, absolutely seals? not, because that's, that police officer is a target. Um, all you have to do is compromise that one police officer, and now you have um, uh, access to compromise that. And SEALs, as I've said uh, several times previously, in my view, are just security theater. So S SEALs are a good thing to have because they remind everybody of the need for security. But the SEALs themselves don't provide security because they can so easily be defeated by anybody who's familiar with the process. Um, and, and, and that's what I mean by saying it's just theater. Um, uh, should, should somebody trust having me have all of the ballots? And the answer is no. <laughs> you need a system that has checks and balances built into it to um, uh, uh, provide adequate assurance that there's no way to compromise the um, uh, cust the chain of custody of the ballots, and and having one person overnight with the ballots. Uh, what if what if, for sufficient. example, I've heard the same issues you have, but what if all the ballots go back to the board and they're just protecting the shell of the machine with the seals? Well, maybe. Um, uh, and assuming that like the board example, itself heard, has adequate security well, like I've at heard their New York facility. City, for example, they, they have the police bring their ballots back and forth. And I, I believe their plan is, from watching their board meeting, is they're going to bring all of their ballots back each night securely, and then the police officer would guard the machine. The sealed machine. Just the sealed, empty machine. With the PMD or without the PMD? I don't know. I don't remember. Well, but that's... But, but I know, an important but, but detail. all of those details make a difference. And, and all I want them to do is to put it on paper so that we can look at it. I agree. No, no, I'd be willing to entertain it. I'm not sure I agree with the commissioner on the concerns I have about the police agency being involved, because I know they already are in the New York City election process. Police have been involved with the city ballots for decades. Frankly, as, as a security measure in New York City, they right. trust the police more than anybody, and, 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 and I do too. So I'm not as concerned maybe about that aspect, but I do agree that this is a very important issue, generally, security of ballots, and that I think this mandate was put in there to get some assurance that everybody's comfortable with the way the counties are doing it, and does that mean we have to see what they're doing? Yes, it does, and then we should have that opportunity. So I do agree with that. So I think that when the message is, is given to the, the county boards that, you know, that there's a consensus among the commissioners, and this is coming straight from the commissioners, so I would strongly urge blah, blah, blah. 
and you know, let's see what happens. I would say that you know, ninety nine percent of them will come back immediately. You know, they have a, as as we've as we've said here, got to have some sympathy for the county boards because they're under a tremendous amount of stress. Everything is new. Uh, they're, they're running around trying to get everything correct so that we don't screw up on, on election day or the, or the uh, uh, or the, the time nine days ahead of time. So all of this has to be done. Yes, but it's also you have a certain amount of mandates. And sorry about that, but got to do it. Thank you. Yeah, but this is only a plan. They don't have to do right. it. They have to just submit the plan. Submit a plan as to what you're going to do. Well, well what you're going to do. And we have to approve and reject it. That's like what I would plan. say. That's <laughs> right. I'd like to disassociate right. myself from those comments. Right. But, right. but every county, I mean, we know New York City, Westchester, Suffolk, Nassau, all have plans. They just have to sit down and yeah, send them to us. Okay. And if it's only a draft, it's only a draft. But uh, at right. least we can uh, look at it, and uh, and and the public can make comments or um, criticisms uh, with respect to the plan. And time is short. All right, I think agreed. we we're yeah, all agreed, agreed on this. Um, and uh, I've accomplished my objective, okay. which is putting a little bit of a match under the feet of our own executive directors to make this a priority. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, PIO. All right, yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, John Conklin and Cheryl Kowser. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the Public Information Office continues to be busy. Uh, we've had uh, a lot of questions. Uh, probably the most uh, asked question we've had since the last board meeting is about the deadline to change one's enrollment to qualify for the primaries for next year. So we've had conditional answers unless the statute changed, which the statute recently changed. So we're answering lots of questions on that. Uh, the political calendar, the presidential primary calendar, the date for the presidential primary next year. Uh, what if there's a vacancy in an office because the date moved from September 20th to the first week in August, whether if there was a vacancy it would go on the ballot for this year. Um, lots of questions about early voting, the uh, electronic poll books, um, the, the always popular topics of campaign finance. Um, and to a much lesser degree than before, we still get a few questions on the time off to vote law. So uh, the units are also participated in the monthly ECA calls in July, August, and September. Uh, we processed 87 FOILs in July, 78 in August, and 62 in September. Uh, we issued two press releases since the last board meeting. Um, September 24th was the National Voter Registration Day. We did a press release on that. And we also had a staff member, Jeff Baez, present at the second annual Cyber Summit conference uh, down at just outside Washington. Um, we're updating the voter registration form uh, in compliance with the change regarding 16-year-olds. Uh, all the forms have been translated. Uh, that change goes in effect January 1st, 2020. We expect to do a drop shipment in the middle of December in preparation for the January 1st effective date, and we are currently canvassing the county boards to determine what, uh, what number of forms they're looking for uh, in the shipment. Uh, some of the items that uh, PIO is tracking, I mean, this was all part of the conversation just had in terms of the communication plans and the whole site accessibility surveys. So we're tracking those. Um, we continue to press the six counties that haven't given us the communication plan yet. Um, and that was mentioned on the ECA call again last week as well. So um, we worked with IT on the second year requirements for the launch of uh, SANS training. Um, as last we checked, about 45% are in process or have satisfied this year's requirements. Uh, it's taking a little longer than uh, the first year for people to, to ramp up and, and complete those. Uh, with regard to the website, uh, we posted the 2020 political calendar, the 2020 presidential political calendar. Uh, we had a couple of updates to the 2019 political calendar. Uh, we posted the website, the webcast for the July 25th and the August 28th board meeting. Uh, we also did the transcripts for the June 27th and the August 28th meeting. 
Uh, we posted a notice to the calendar events for the public demo last week on the Dominion uh, ImageCast Evolution uh, printer upgrade. Uh, we also posted information on the Universal Posting Union, Postal Union issue for overseas voters. That was resolved favorably. Um, and we did some updates to the, to the Move Act information page as well. Uh, with regard to NVRA, uh, we did some trainings on the 21st of August. Uh, we had a training with the Department of Health in New York City. There were 80 people attended that. Uh, there was another training in Syracuse on the 27th for the Department of Health as well. 55 people attended that. Uh, September 17th, we did an MVRA training for uh, the Human Resources Administration in New York City. 370 people attended that. Uh, with regard to board visits uh, in August, we visited Delaware, Dutchess, Columbia, and Onondaga, and in September we did Westchester, Niagara, Erie, Genesee, Livingston, and Yates. Um, Michael and Patrick would like you to know that they traveled 2,450 miles for those board visits. So at this point we have visited every county board required within the two-year cycle. Uh, we only have one board left, which is New York City, and they asked for, for their uh, a uh, review to be scheduled for after Election Day, which we accommodated them on that. So we, we will be done before the end of the year and then start the cycle again. Uh, with regard to grants, um, the Eight to Localities grant was approved by the Division of the Budget since the last board meeting. Uh, Cheryl and I did a presentation at the ECA conference on uh, the capital grant. Uh, the Eight to Localities grant will be substantially similar in terms of processing. Uh, but we will do a webinar with regard to that uh, tomorrow. Um, so with regard to the capital grant, which was the first one, uh, we approximately have 49 counties that have returned their contracts. That's about 84 percent. Sixteen of them have been finalized and are in place, and we're waiting on nine more to submit theirs. Uh, with regard to the Aid to Localities contract, uh, we received them from OGS on September 24th. They have been sent to the counties. That was on September 27th. And as I said, we're going to do a webinar tomorrow. Uh, with regard to the website accessibility coordinator position, um, or responsibilities, I should say, uh, we're in the process of da drafting the first report that's due to the plaintiffs under the final settlement agreement. Uh, we've and discuss other parts of the website that require action before the end of the year. Um, and to date, we've remediated nearly 1,800 PDF documents on the website. Um, lastly, uh, the, the Move Act transition from the outside vendor CIDL to an internal uh, application. Uh, we did a webinar. Um, Tom did a webinar on August 9th. Uh, we participated in that. Uh, we helped. Uh, do some stuff on the user guide for the county boards. Um, we assisted in credentialing the county users. Uh, we updated the state user guide procedures um, and did an FAQ uh, or helped with an FAQ. That went live on September 13th. Uh, all the counties uploaded their absentee ballots on September by September 20th, which was the, the final day. Uh, the last one was around 6.15 on that day, which is um, much earlier than their usual practice in the past. So that has improved greatly, and that's largely due to the work of IT in the Election Operations Unit. And we've gotten very good feedback from the counties on the new system. They liked it. Uh, so uh, in terms of fielding calls on it from the public and the counties, uh, the, the PIO is it's being transitioned to PIO to answer and, and, and respond to those questions. So that's the, that's the end of my report. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Um, so uh, information technology, Bill Cross. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, we've had a very productive couple months since uh, my last report. Um, for projects, particularly around campus fitus, I'm happy to report we've accomplished a major milestone in terms of the release of EFS to the beta, uh, beta test group on September 11th. Overall feedback has been very positive. Um, the issues that have been reported uh, have been pretty minor in nature. Uh, we're also continuing development on ba uh, ballot access portion of the system, which is nearly complete, and FIDUS, as well as significant progress on the data conversion effort in terms of bringing legacy data into the new system. 
Um, of course, the, the time frame has not changed uh, for that project from what I reported previously. Um, obviously, a lot of depend on uh, feedback from the beta test group, but that's been very positive. So, uh, so what what is the time frame now? We're still saying within we'll have completion through this year and ready for beginning of next. So we're talking about the January fifteenth filing will be on the new system. It'll be a um, or that'll be the last use of the old system. We're anticipating we can use it. We have to finalize, obviously, the beta test with this. That's that's the major piece that um, we need feedback on, and we're still finalizing. Uh, data exchange with the third party filers. You're not answering my question. <laughs> no, we are. That is the target, yes. But so the I'm, target I'm is that, that the, the goal is that all filers will be using the new system for the January filing. I believe or that. Go ahead. I believe that's where we at right now. But I am footnoting is that there's there's some significant work to be done still between now and then that could affect that. But that's that is our target. Yes. All right, understood. And I appreciate it. And I'm sorry if I was a little <laughs> that's fine. I mean, but <laughs> go ahead. I'm I'm as as anxious as you are. Trust me. Uh, nice voter. Uh, we continue to work with the vendors and the county boards to prepare for early voting, specifically uh, reporting voter history into Nice Voter. Uh, the vendors are making changes to their systems to accommodate um, information that related to early voting, and we've provided a template to the county boards for affidavit reporting. Um, and then the, the process will be they will provide these uh, lists of affidavit voters via the template we provided. We'll do matching on it and turn it around to them so they can prepare for, uh, for duplicates. Um, nice ballad. Um, also happy to report that uh, we finalized development, as John said, for the new Nice Valid application. Uh, it went live on September 13th, replacing the side all system for military and overseas voters. Uh, and feedback has been very positive on that as well. Uh, online voter registration, particularly around the new legislation, we've been working with Nice Tech um, and have developed and presented at least a preliminary project plan to budget and have started analysis for the new system, including doing research on other state solutions uh, and documenting the current as-is process. Uh, EPO on, book. On, on that subject, sure. on the online voter registration, so we've heard suggestions that the New York City Campaign Finance Board believes that they have a turnkey system that, that could be used. That has, would, what right. has been your reaction to that proposal? We have not yet seen that system. It is on the agenda for us to look, we're looking at existing systems and mapping out. Uh, we've reached out to other states. We've, we've talked to uh, New York City's end tier for a vendor. We will be reaching out to the Campaign Finance Board for, to have that conversation, to see if it is, if it does, if there's any applicable use uh, in the okay. process. Um, e books IT is to, uh, continue to participate in that effort uh, internally and with OGS and will be involved in the network uh, security validation efforts and verifications. Uh, legislation and budget, as, as co-executive directors have mentioned, uh, we, IT has been participating in those discussions uh, and issues and impacts of the new legislation. And of course, accessibility, John already covered, but we are uh, on track to meet the, the requirements that we need to by the end of the year for this settlement. Um, for security, we've had a new security, uh, election security specialist, uh, Courtney, uh, uh, to our uh, security election center team. Uh, she joins us from the state ITS and has over 12 years cybersecurity experience along with a master's in cybersecurity and multiple certifications. Um, welcome to Courtney. Uh, for this county board cybersecurity efforts, of course, we presented at the conference, um, but we're also now in the report phase for the county board risk assessments. Uh, we finalized an additional 11 reports. Uh, we're working with Grant Thornton on drafts for several others. I think there's about 15 that we're currently going back and forth with with those, including New York City and the overall trends report. Um, since our last report, an additional 15 county boards 
have been covered by the managed, managed security services offering, that's Sidera, uh, bringing the current total to 20 county boards covered by that offering. Um, we've also had additional discussions with OGS and other partners on how best to move forward mitigation and remediation phases um, past the risk assessment. Um, and our secure election team has issued two newsletters to the county boards, one on cybersecurity trends that we've identified from the reports we received, and as well as another on ransomware. And we will be presenting a webinar uh, to the county boards on Monday uh, to follow up on that ransomware message. Um, we've also been in contact with the FBI from the Western District of New York regarding a presentation from the county boards in that area. And we're going to work with them to see if there's a potential to expand that, expand that effort uh, for the remainder of the state. Um, we ourselves have committed, uh, completed our risk assessment with uh, federal DHS here. Uh, Two-week engagement uh, both ec involved both external and internal scanning and on-site. Um, they the results. Uh, confirmed that a lot of things we've done over the past three years uh, have been very effective, uh, but also you know they identified you know several areas where we still need have work to do. Uh, as mentioned above, in terms of budget planning, you know, we've been in discussions with budget and executive deputy to ensure that we're able to make these needed improvements. Um, we continue to work on the Nice Voter Data Project with the SUNY Center for Technology and Government uh, on. Ad, uh, an anomaly detection of nice voter data. Uh, had a, rep a nice report out from them, and they've identified some very done some very nice uh, graphical representations of uh, information from that system. Um, we're also working with them to dis develop a scope for envisioning an elections future, which would be um, what would the next architecture of elections look like from an end-to-end -end perspective, uh, mainly in the area of security, but overall architecture. Um, and as always, we continue to work on multiple security improvements for our own infrastructure. This period in particular, we've made some significant improvements, uh, refreshing our legacy environment, uh, improving our security posture, which of course I really can't go into details, but good, very good progress this period on that. Uh, and in terms of the website, it's uh, normal levels for a non-election period, an average of about, uh, about a quarter million views per month on our main website. All right, then we uh, go next to enforcement, uh, and I do not see Risa Sugarman present. Uh, let's just go over the statistics for her unit. Um, I, um, we have uh, how many outstanding non-filers? Um, the aggregate number, I don't know. I covered the numbers in the last I, two. I, I recall it was a little over 2,000 was the current number of outstanding non-filer referrals? It's vastly more than that, but for, for the last, for the July periodic alone, it's 20, it's 2,000, close to 3,000. Okay. And um, uh, I noticed that this month, Ms. Sugarman brought one enforcement proceeding, and that's the second year to date, is that correct? There are two year to date hearing officer proceedings that have been commenced. All right, so that's finally served. That's two out of many thousand. Yes. Okay. And uh, referrals for um, deficiencies? Um, the numbers are basically the same as they were um, the last time around. Um, it's uh, nearly, it's, well, I don't remember the exact number, it's the same. <clears throat> and and there have been zero proceedings to uh, address deficiencies a year to date. That's correct. Okay. And then um, uh, criminal case referrals, uh, zero year to date, correct? That is correct. And uh, subpoenas for investigations, uh, zero year to date, correct? That's correct. And um, reports on closed investigations? Zero year to date. Okay. I think. Uh, all right. That shows what's happening. Um, Not happening. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, that concludes our unit uh, reports. Uh, next item uh, is uh, on old business, uh, the uh, resolution on the use of force for peace officers policy pursuant to uh, Chapter 55, Part ZZ. This issue, um, uh, just before your last meeting, we received comments from the Enforcement Council with regard to the draft policy. The meeting, uh, we've had two meetings at the co-executive enforcement level to try and get um, a, a track change, you know, what, what exactly, what, you know, a melding of the two plans together. Um, we provided a soft copy of the written proposal that we presented to you to enforcement. Just uh, yesterday we received a response back from enforcement. It, it wasn't necessarily in track change. But, um, but we can do a compare version. So um, we had we asked you to lay this aside until the December meeting um, because we just got the comments. We'd like to review them, and, and also Risa has asked for a period of time to, to, to talk to us about once we received her comments. Um, and since we just got them within the last day or so, um, it's not possible to make a recommendation to you at this meeting, so we're gonna, we'd like to get a move it to the December meeting. It doesn't seem to be a, a per se a pressing issue, but we can certainly. All right. Do all the commissioners agree? No, yeah. Yeah. All right. So then we'll go to the next item, which is uh, Fair Campaign Code Matter 19-1. Uh, this issue was discussed at the uh, last uh, meeting and was um, uh, carried over because the, the underlying issues were involved in litigations um, uh, that is related to some of the central issues that are, um, that are alleged in the complaint, that remains true. So this is here as a, as a placeholder. Um, the litigation does remain. So we ask that it continue to be held over. Okay, so we'll, so we'll move fine. on to new business. Uh, the, um, we have... Uh, Regulations for final adoption, two, two of them. The first item is uh, the amendment to Part 62.10.18 uh, on uh, audits for early voting. Um, uh, did we receive any additional comments on the uh, final proposal? On the audits, no. Okay. So I, I'm prepared to move that for adoption. I'll so, move it. All right. Second. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so that reg is adopted. Um, the next is the um, uh, final adoption of uh, Regulation 6210.19 on the minimum required uh, voting machines for early voting. And in this, the final reg is uh, uh, revised from the original uh, proposal to uh, clarify a situation that we overlooked um, w on the number of machines required if uh, a county uh, uses the vote center approach so that they don't have to uh, staff every single voting location as if it were the only location for those voters. Um, are, are there any additional comments? that should be brought before the commissioners? All right, so is there a motion? I'll move it. All right. Uh, Second. Second. Uh, those in favor say aye. Aye. All right, that uh, regulation is adopted. All right, uh, uh, next is... Uh, Excuse me, just on that regulation, we are running up against a hard deadline there, too, just to point out that... Uh, the request for the reduction of machines shall be made not later than 20 days before the vo early voting period begins. So perhaps we should do a little forced. Well, measure. that means they're not going to reduce the number of machines. Or they have to ask us. I, I understand. And if they haven't asked us, then they have to provide all the machines. Right? Well, actually, if they're, if they're using vote centers under the amendment in three, um, the distribution of machines um, amongst the vote centers <coughs> is as they as they see fit. So that so the provision I believe that Kim is referring to is if they want to do a reduction for some other reason. Oh, so I think I think they're in good shape. 
All right, but good. I'm glad you're looking at it. Um, all right, so uh, now we're on the uh, ballot accountability temporary or emergency regulations, um, which are uh, 6277 and 62110. And, and th these are the emergency regulations that provide for how they're going to track the number of ballots uh, in lieu of using stubs, right? On both of these emergency, um, they will age out before our next meeting. It would be our, it has been our intent to look at the experience in this uh, early voting um, to make sure in both of them that we are comfortable with the wording and we also think we'll get other comments as we are in the um, early voting period. I'm, I'm sorry, Bob. Age out. Um, well, the, the, expire. the emergency will expire, so we, by asking you to renew them today, okay. they won't expire. Okay. And I didn't want to have an expired regulation in time for the November election, or, or at least until we're... But we don't want to do final regulations until we can review what happens in November. We have a couple of comments. Um, we think we'll get more. We think our, our own experience, we might want to look at things to make sure it's worded as clearly as we want. But these will be the regulations in place for, for this now. fall. Correct. Yeah. So right. we're, we're recommending that we um, keep them as emergency uh, and then we'll with them at the December meeting. So there is a resolution to extend the uh, uh, accountability regulations. Uh, is there a motion to adopt it? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, the, those in favor say aye. Aye. All right. So that resolution is adopted. And then um, similarly, there is a uh, resolution to extend the emergency regulations on the procedures for early voting, which we did discuss uh, at some length earlier. Um, so is there a motion to uh, adopt that second? I'll second. All right. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. So, so that just so we understand good. that yes, those of two sets of regulations will come back to us again yeah. for yes. final adoption. This again is extending the emergency. Okay. Okay. All right. Make changes. We'll have to go back out for more comments. Gotcha. All right. So next is the uh, resolution um, uh, approving the uh, certification of the um, Dominion upgrade um, for uh, uh, Dominion ImageCast 4.14.27. Um, Tom, do you want to briefly just to explain the procedures and the recommendation of the uh, Sure. So <clears throat> this upgrade kind of came out of our conversations from a few months ago about doing um, a deeper look at the the print the printing functionality of the ICE since the machine itself is kind of a um, a scanner and BMD hybrid. Um, one of the things that Dominion had to do was they submitted a, a, a firmware upgrade which would allow for uh, a couple of different data points to be extracted from the system and then be generated on the tapes that are produced by the machine so that the, the Board of Elections staff at the county level would be able to review that data to make sure that it's, it, it's matching up the way it should. Um, so you have the hardware of the printer itself, uh, which tracks how many times it actually engages, and that's stored in one set of onboard memory. Uh, and then you have this software which tells the printer when to print. So that's another data point. Uh, in addition, since the printer really should only be engaging during an accessible voting session, uh, the software is also tracking how many accessible voting sessions are being engaged and how many um, ballots are being cast out of an accessible voting session. Uh, the idea being that at the, when the zero tape is produced at the beginning of the election, you're going to have your starting numbers as far as, because one of the counters would be uh, would be zero for the number of times that that software is told the printer to print, and the other one, the, the actual number that's generated from the hardware is kind of like a running tally. So you would know what number you're starting with from the beginning of the election. Uh, as part of the 3% audit process, uh, on the on the closing tapes those numbers are also then printed and you'd be able to determine that the printer print as many times as the software thinks it told the printer to print and obviously those two should always add up uh, in addition they should also add up with the number of accessible voting sessions that there are 
and the number of times that a ballot is cast. There are times in which um, those latter two numbers could theoretically not match up. If I went through the process of doing an accessible voting session um, and I didn't actually print anything on a ballot, well, then the printer would never have been engaged, but there would be one extra accessible voting session. Um, so the idea was to kind of get more information out of the system that wasn't possible before so that at the beginning of the process, you know that what you're starting with at the end of the process, you know how many times the printer was engaged, and so you can make a determination that it did uh, perform the way it was supposed to. So we had gotten that software. We did our source code review as we normally do with any of the upgrades. We consulted with uh, NYSTEC, our partner, uh, in doing security reviews. Uh, we did functional testing on that. We did a public test uh, on 924, uh, and we submitted all the reports and the findings of those tests and the reviews to the commissioners for approval. Uh, if approved, then we would distribute that upgrade to the counties who currently have the ICE machines in place. All right. Okay. Now, one of the uh, parts of uh, the, the point of this is that the audit procedures should be revised to use this function. So, so where where is that in the resolution? Oh, in the in the resolution, I don't believe that it's. I don't know if we've been typically had a commission approval of revisions to procedures, but I did provide the proposed revision to the procedure in the packet of information I provided. All right, before. so so that procedure is binding on the counties. Am I correct? Yes. All right. All right, so is there a motion to approve the resolution? I'll move that. I'll and, second it. All right, and then I have some comments, if you don't mind, just to, that, that I prepared and <laughs> carefully thought through on this, <laughs> uh, that I just want to get in the record. So... Uh, in my view, the single paper path is a design flaw that's present in the Dominion image cast evolution. And the same is also true when the ESNS ExpressVote XL and the ExpressVote HW 2.0 are used as both a marker and a tabulator. These three systems allow a ballot to pass under a software controlled printer after the ballot has been cast. The printers are not software independent because a change in the software can make an undetectable change to the results. So this Dominion ImageCast 4.14.27 update does not solve the fundamental problem. The update merely adds logging to the process. The logging is good. It can provide useful data during troubleshooting or investigating, but the power of logging as a security measure itself is limited. Software-controlled logging may not provide reliable forensic evidence if the software is compromised. It does not itself assure that the ballot counted is the same as the ballot verified by the voter. Uh, however small, the printer logging feature is an improvement over what's certified now. It's added to a dozen other security features that add assurance, but not a guarantee that the voting machine is not hackable, is not hacked to create an archived ballot different from the ballot verified by the voter. So in view of these additional Adding this to a number of other additional security features is a positive factor, and therefore uh, I'm voting um, in favor of this resolution with the reservations that I've noted. Uh, any other comments? All right, so those in favor of the resolution say aye. 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 Opposed? So the resolution carries. Um, have we, uh, we've come to the end of the agenda. Uh, we'll uh, entertain a motion to go into executive session. Do, do we want to talk about uh, dates? We have December 12th for that meeting, was... so if we want okay. another All right. pending date. Do we meet. need anything in between? Well, if there's an issue over the security plans, I think we should be on standby, sure. but we're talking about Telecom. a relatively short telephone conference then. Okay. okay.
All right, uh, Jared. Um, Jared Berg is from uh, New York Early Voting, or, or no, Vote Early New York. Vote Early NY. Okay. I and, appreciate the opportunity. And, and so. Jared, I just want to say, I know you've been putting we a lot of time into this, hour, and Jared, it's almost as if Jared has been an extra that. staff member for us and the county boards, uh, helping them get this enormous project done. Go ahead, Jared. Thanks for the opportunity, and I appreciate the kind words. I just want to say at the outset, you folks are under enormous pressure, incredible new mandates uh, with budget cuts that I think defy logic. So uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm doing everything I can to help get the word about, out about this new program. I'd also make sure it's implemented properly. I just want to start by sharing just some of the lit uh, that we developed and produced uh, along with our partners at Let New York Vote, English and Spanish. You folks are welcome to this lit. If any county is interested in this, these are the statewide versions, but we're happy to work with any county on a nonpartisan basis to develop local lit. Uh, on the back it has uh, the days, but the local lit uh, would have the hours too, and it directs folks to our site uh, where we've mapped the statewide early voting program because uh, that resource doesn't actually exist, um, not part of your mandate. Of course, uh, I do just want to hold up. This is what New York City has done. Uh, I assume this was somewhere in their communications plan. Uh, these I voted early stickers just to flag for counties. Uh, when you move away from the single election day model, you create the opportunity to do uh, sort of social pressure engagement over the several days. So uh, it might be a little late for someone if they didn't have time that evening on election day to vote, right? You see a colleague, oh, they voted, I don't have time today. But with so much, so many extra days, there is that opportunity to get awareness out dynamically during the early voting period. Um, so uh, with that, I do just want to mention we're down to four, only four localities that have invoked the temporary exception in this law to assign sites. Uh, that's incredible. If you asked me where I thought we'd be six months ago, I was worried that more might invoke that. Who are uh, they? New York City? They are New West York City, uh, Westchester, Albany has a hybrid model, uh, and the fourth one is Orange County uh, as well. Westchester and Albany... Uh, are doing what I would call a hybrid, where they actually have a sort of local pilot uh, program to do more than one single site. So we're really excited, and of course, if that goes successfully, we hope they'll expand soon. Um, I do want to raise, just sort of uh, generally speaking, some concerns about uh, the e -poll book configurations that I think might be ripe for this state board to take up uh, on a going forward basis. Um, I think we really need a model standard for configurations for at least each vendor. Uh, they were, these vendors are, pride themselves on uh, giving deference and sort of local flexibility to the counties uh, to uh, put local configurations in there. None of these companies, as far as I know, are New York based. Uh, they certainly are not thinking about New York law when they design the template uh, language that's in there, meaning the workflow of the actual buttons you press on the iPad. Uh, they have told counties, oh, you can change that on the back end to some extent. Uh, I don't think it would make sense to have 62 or 57 different varieties of what that means. Uh, and then you divide that by the three different vendors, which have different uh, configurations and workflows. So it would be really nice to have a standard. Uh, and the other thing they might be able to provide to you folks, uh, or at least work with you folks on, um, we are slightly late to this party. These jurisdictions are being, these, these vendors are being used in other places. So uh, there's the opportunity to say to them, from a state perspective, we want to know if there's a problem with one of your devices in Philadelphia or some other place where these might have been used, either during early voting or on election day, if there's a set of best practices they've seen from their work across the country, either in educating poll workers or how to configure them or the public, why don't they just share that with you folks? But I think it's worth asking and almost, you know, you folks have leverage to say, hey, before or as we are deploying these devices across the state, We'd like to have some best practices from you that we can then uh, distribute down to the county level. Uh, I'm frankly concerned of different counties coming up with those configurations uh, without guidance from the collective wisdom here. Um, which counties are using which e-poll books? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, uh, and I think this board deserves to know the answer to that question, or at least the ones that aren't adopting and the ones that are adopting, what vendor? Uh, you folks might have that information. We are building that anecdotally. Uh, but to do everything I just mentioned, that would make sense as something that you folks should have. Um, 
And they're not rhetorical, but it feels like there's many possible answers uh, to some of this stuff. Um, but I do want to uh, tell you folks, I'm really excited about the back-end ePoll book data uh, that these things are capable of. Provides some amazing new analytics for you folks and the counties. Um, I don't know who exactly uh, is allowed to have the back end to that at the county level. Um, but to give you a sense, it tells you how many people are checking in, how many people have been challenged. There should be something in there that tells you someone checked in and then was uh, pushed into the provisional affidavit spot. Um, the point is it could provide a lot of valuable data to the state board to gauge compliance, how many people are using a given vote center, uh, turnout, challenges, affidavits, check-ins, um, and also how long does it actually take from an e-poll book check-in for that ballot on demand printer to output. Uh, the vendors uh, have their sales pitch on that, but you folks deserve to know that in real time, what happens when we deploy these things uh, in practice. So that data exists. I believe, I'm sure the vendors have it. We know that the counties have it, and I think there should be some state analog that you folks have. Um, and I think the campaigns have their own thoughts on how they might benefit from that. It's not my business. Uh, on the security plan, you know, I almost wasn't going to bring this up uh, because I sort of thought this might have been settled by now. All I can say is there's a plain reading of that statute, and I think it's really important that we interpret words as they mean. Uh, I will not bring up... Um, the issue about who's required to file this plan. Um, I will mention that even for those counties with a single uh, site at their BOE, as in the, the majority of ones who have filed, it is different, right? They've never kept live untabulated ballots for nine days. So just an explanation on what the plan is there, uh, you know, would be a good to have. Um, and I believe it's required by the statute. But there's two other creative liberties that I'm hearing about interpreting these regs. And I think it does invite people to not comply with them. So the reg says approval, 60 days. Not submission by 60 days, approval by. Uh, and it also says the first election it was used. To me, that's August 26th. First election it was used is going to be October 26th. So when people talk about elections, it's the first day of early voting. That's at least what it was intended to mean. Frankly, it's what it says. If not, uh, we should at least make sure these things say what the folks who uh, fought for them and wrote them and have to implement them, believe them to say. And these counties have actually, all the ones who have filed, have abided by uh, the interpretation that I just laid out here. Um, the last thing I just want to say, right, if a voter misses a deadline under this election law, it is fatal. So we don't have to sit here and come up with excuses for why counties don't file. I'm sure they all have the best intentions. I know they're laboring under deadlines, so are you folks. But deadlines either matter or they don't in this business. And they always matter for voters. So with that, I want to thank you for all you're doing. I want to invite you folks to visit Vote Early NY. Let us know how we can help get the word out about this program. Good luck with early voting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. All right. Also permission to speak? Uh, yes, but try to keep it brief. Sure. Thank you so much, Commissioner Gunner. I'm Lulu Freitas. Uh, I'm the co-founder and communications director from Smart Elections. And I'm here particularly out of concern for the Express Vote XL certification that's coming up. There continues to be a great deal of concern about that among security experts and voters. I have voters emailing me on a regular basis saying, what's going on with that? We're very concerned. We really don't want that machine certified. I really appreciated Commissioner Kellner's comments about that, drawing attention to the design flaw of those all-in-one machines where they can print on a paper ballot after the voter casts it. And I just wanted to draw the commissioner's attention to the fact that the machine does print with barcodes. Colorado has now become the first state to ban barcodes in use for counting votes. Uh, they are considered the security leader uh, in the states due to their implementation of risk limiting audits. And I know that New York also considers itself a security leader. So I think that's something that New York wa might want to take note of that Col Colorado has banned uh, the use of barcodes uh, for counting votes. And I appreciate also what you were saying, Thomas, about the making ESNS put that new um, print in if there is no vote, so there's not a blank space where the barcode is supposed to be that, that perhaps a malware program could take advantage of. I think the, and it's great that we're being as careful as possible. I think the problem with that kind of thinking is that 
a malware program can overcome that easily. The malware program, even though it's the, the regular ballot is supposed to print something there that says no vote or some sort of space filler, a malware program can just instruct the, um, the machine to leave the space and then take advantage of the space when the ballot passes back through. So I, I think it's, it's really important important that we're taking these safety precautions, but it's also important to be aware that they are not necessarily a solution. The best solution is not to certify a machine that experts across the country and other states have become, have cons are considering extremely suspect. Um, I'm also appreciative of the steps that you uh, are taking about the Dominion. Um, my question is, if you do have this reconciliation process and it doesn't add up, what is the remedy? Is there any thing in place that tells the counties then, well, what do they do? Are the votes then disqualified? Do they have a new election? So even though, again, as I, I agree with Commissioner Kellner, it's good that we're taking these steps, I do question what is then the remedy if something is, um, you know, if something is detected that there is some sort of, uh, some sort of issue there. And then the other question that I wanted to bring up before the board is I had several voters uh, say to me that there's new procedures that they're hearing about from the county board of elections that voters and people who work the polls are no longer going to be allowed to photograph the poll tapes. And that's something that I think traditionally voters and poll workers have been allowed to do and is considered a, a common check on the results. And I was just wondering if that's legitimate that these county boards, this was in Westchester in particular, and I think possibly in New York City, although I'm trying to find out more about that, but definitely Westchester. Is that something that the, the county boards are actually allowed to say, that, that voters and poll workers can no longer photograph the poll tapes? Um, if so, I think that's very concerning, and I would hope that the commissioners would take action on that and put a stop to that. Thank you so much for allowing me uh, a few minutes to speak. I really appreciate all of the focus here on security. Um, it's really, um, it's nice to see. I really appreciate it. I know that you guys are doing a lot of work on that, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd just like to add that uh, I strongly agree with the uh, concept that uh, people should be allowed to make copies of the poll tapes at the poll site. That's the whole point of having the canvas at the poll site. Uh, but this is the first I'm hearing of a jurisdiction preventing people from doing that. The only thing I could think of is that perhaps it's somewhat of a misunderstanding because obviously um, the early voting allows you to start closing and generating results by 8 p.m. on election day. But obviously there are a lot of counties who are putting um, position, protections in place so that people who can witness the canvas who are legally allowed to be there remain incommunicado, as I believe that, as the language says, so that they can't take pictures of something and tweet out results before the close of polls on election day. For that one hour. Right. right. So it may be that this is just with respect to that one hour period. I Maybe mean, we can find out about that, because I know the people that I spoke with said that this was specifically training that they were receiving from the Westchester County Board of Elections as poll workers telling them, do not photograph the poll tapes, and it sounded like it was a more global instruction. Okay. Well, thank you for calling it to our attention. You're welcome. Thank you for taking it. All right. Time. So uh, the motion is to uh, go into executive session for personnel matters? Correct. Okay. Can, can we... Uh, can we look at January now for a meeting? Sure, if you want to. Yeah. It would help me out if I knew what the meeting was. January. If we can do it. What would you like? The meet, the, uh, so, Bob, we're looking at January? The week of the 15th. You, you, want, to the yes. you want to meet that week? Yes. You want to meet that week? If you can. So that's, I, I bet the week of the 13th, starting that's on the 13th. That's the week of the 13th, right. So that's the week after the, the winter conference. The winter conference is 6th uh, to the 9th in Albany. Okay, so you want to meet the week after that? Martin Luther King Day is the 20th, so as long as it's not that day. I mean, I'm okay good, that, I'm week. that week. So. I'm okay that week. You're okay? Yeah. Okay. So January, whatever day is convenient for you guys. So pick a day. How about the 15th? 15th? How's that? Wait, 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 wait. Let me see. No, the 15th. That's the only day that's not good. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, Andy. <laughs> You're changing the rules. That's why here. I got it. <laughs> How about the 16th? 16th is good. 16th. Uh, uh, I already 
is that point? Yeah, that's okay. I'll have sure. to change an appointment, but it's okay. That's early Thank enough. To All right, we'll do that. Thank you, sir. And and for, for the December meeting, we'll have for you with the political calendar set. Where would be the decision points with regard to certifying? Um, the ballot president's a little different. For the, who does what? Um, but yeah. but if we can give you the dates that we think will require for the state calendar and anything that's related to the federal calendar, at least you can consider finding up any of those dates that we really need a decision uh, by in the first half of the year. So we can have that for you in December. I don't know that we'll need the answers in December, but maybe by the January meeting, if you look at your calendars and we try and come up with um, how to get us through the, mostly you're making determinations on ballot access challenges so that we can um, get the ballot going on time. Okay. All right. Now let me just confirm, the December meeting? Well, 12. Okay. Got it. Okay. Are we doing that here? So once we go in, we're not coming order. back to... No, we're not coming back. Okay, so this is the end of the public session. Do we need everybody for the you know, session? No, I don't. No. You want just the executive directors, or do you want more? You, you gotta, you gotta. We, we didn't vote on tying up. The oh yeah, we have to, we have to vote on it too. Right. But, but who's going to come into this? Uh, well, I don't really care. Session? I just don't think we need everybody. I, though. I don't know enough about the discussion to know who should be in and who shouldn't be in. All right. Well. All right. So. Uh, think, we we, uh, yes. And the councils. And the councils, I think, should be there. Okay. Too. Yeah. Good. So executive directors and, and the, the councils. councils. Okay. Oh, and right. ops too. All right. Okay. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Everybody so, but John and Cheryl. Who's going to run the recording? Bill, equipment? Bill.